Good morning. It's great to be back here at City Center. Every time I come to City Center, I'm blessed and I rejoice when I'm traveling to get here. I have been so encouraged in the past year to work with Derek and the elders and the deacons and the staff and all of the men and women of the church that I've come to know and love. And I'm just glad to be with you this morning. So I pray that uh, we'll be blessed together as we take a journey through Proverbs. Um, just on a side note, you know, when I go to visit churches and I work with churches in North America, not every church reacts as City Center Baptist Church reacts. Not every church is open to what I have to say, but uh, your openness to the things of the Lord, to the teachings in his word, to the Lord's direction on how the church ought to operate and how it ought to be run, it's a great encouragement. And I know as you determine to follow the Lord strongly, the best days of this church are ahead. The very best days of this church are ahead as you make disciples and as you baptize and teach those disciples to follow hard after God. Your very best days are ahead. So I've been blessed uh, to be a part of your work for the last year, and I thank you for that privilege. Uh, as I said, we're going to take a walk through the book of Proverbs. The presupposition we have is that any Christian can be wise. Any Christian can be wise. And those words are selected purposefully. Any Christian can be wise. You'll notice I note the word Christian in there. You can have a certain amount of wisdom as a non-Christian, uh, but only a Christian has the mind of Christ. The presupposition, the assumption we have here is that the Christian mind is the one that can be truly wise, the one that can honor God through his life. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, he says in verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And in verse 14 and 15, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so we can instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. So any Christian can be wise. Any Christian. You might think, well, I'm not that bright. Uh, I'm not that smart. I don't know logic. I don't argue very well. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. In the Lord's economy, in the way the Lord runs his world, anyone who knows Jesus can be a wise person. Well, what do we mean by wisdom? Here's what we mean in the biblical sense of wisdom. It is skill for living. Skill for living. It's not erudition. It's not knowing uh, logical arguments like a Socrates or a Plato or very, very smart thoughts. It is simply skill for living. That was the Jewish mindset. And in the entire scriptures, the biblical wisdom is skill for living. That's all it is. It's knowing what to do and how to do it. Wisdom is pictured, for example, in Proverbs verse eight, uh, chapter 8. Excuse me. Wisdom calls out from the gates. It's pictured as a woman calling out in the streets. Listen to what uh, the Proverbs says starting in chapter 8. Proverbs 8 start, uh, starting in verse 1. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portal, she cries aloud, To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. O simple ones, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense. Wisdom, pictured as a woman, at the gates, in the road, in the city, telling people, crying out with urgency, listen to what I have to say to you. That's the Lord speaking to us today. In verse 6, continuing wisdom says, Hear, hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right, and from my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. And wisdom goes on to say in subsequent verses that wisdom is more value than, valuable than silver and gold and jewels. You want to be a rich person in this life, in, in eternity? 
get wisdom, get skill for living. It's all available to us in the scriptures, and Proverbs in particular speaks of it. It tells us about relationships with God, how we can have a relationship with God that's good and strong. Men with men, men with women, women with men, with, uh, men, women with women. It tells us all about human relationships, how to get along at work, how to deal with co-workers, how to get along with your neighbor. One of my favorite verses in Proverbs says, he who greets his neighbor with a loud voice in the morning, it shall be like a curse to him. So greeting your neighbor with a loud voice in the morning, you might as well curse him is what the proverb says. It talks to us about godly character, how to be skilled for living in your character, how to use money, how to use possessions. It's all there in the book of Proverbs. Now I want to make sure we understand how Proverbs is written. Proverbs teaches us principles of life with the foundation, of course, that we can get skill for living by having a fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you have no fear of God, you're at a bad place. If you're sitting here, you don't fear God, you don't have a sense of the awesomeness of God, it's not a good place for you. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. They don't care what we say. They don't care what the Bible says. They hate it. They despise it. They laugh at it. Proverbs 1.7. You want wisdom, you want skill for living, begin with a foundation of the fear of the Lord, the awesomeness of who he is. It's his world, not mine and not yours, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. How can I get skill for living? Start there. How can I get skill for living? Learn the ways of fools, learn the ways of the wise, and then act upon your knowledge. We're going to run through those, a few of those examples of uh, the ways of fools and the ways of the wise and how to act upon it. But first, I think we need to do a little bit of uh, uh, background on the way Proverbs is written. Proverbs is filled with principles. Principles. A principle is something that is generally true in God's economy. They're generally true. They're not clad in stone like promises. Promises are absolutely guaranteed in the Lord's economy. So don't be confused when you read a proverb and says, well, I don't know. That doesn't sound quite true all the time. It's true generally speaking. That's how Proverbs is written. So principles are generally true in the Lord's economy. For example, Proverbs 11.8, those who do right are saved from trouble, uh, but, those, but trouble comes on those who do wrong. That's generally true. Now I know, of course, Jesus had trouble, and he did right. Paul had trouble, he did right. Lots of women in the scriptures had trouble, they did right. Joseph in the Old Testament had a lot of trouble. He was in prison for doing right. But the principle is, in God's economy, generally, if you do right things, you're saved from trouble. You'll avoid the potholes of life. You'll avoid falling into things that will cause you pain. Those who do right are saved from trouble, generally speaking. It's a principle. How about Proverbs 14, uh, verse 2? The poor is disliked even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends. Friends. Why would a rich person have many friends, I wonder? Uh, because rich people are generally good people, and they're easy to get along with, and they're lots of fun, Right? Uh, no, not right. Generally speaking, rich people have lots of friends because people like the way they live when they hang around rich people, right? They like the way they live when they hang around rich people. That's why rich people have lots of friends. The poor is disliked even by his neighbor because the neighbor often says, he can't do anything for me. I dislike him. I'm not going to hang around him. He's not a priority for me. That's generally true in the world, Proverbs 14, 2. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That is a principle of life. It's not a promise. So many times I remember uh, talking with parents who said, you know, I raised this kid to be a believer in Jesus. I raised him to love the Lord, and he's turned away, maybe for a season, maybe for a long season. I raised him up in the way he should go. He's turned away. Where's the promise of God in that? Well, Proverbs 22, 6 is a principle. It's a generally true statement in the Lord's economy, but we know that each person is held responsible for their decision of what they do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive him, reject him, whatever they do, they are held responsible for it. But generally speaking, if we raise up a child in the way he should go, even when he's old, he won't depart from it. Okay? Principle. How about promises? <clears throat> These are things that are absolutely guaranteed in God's word, in his economy. For example, Genesis 9, 11. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, the Lord said. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Never, ever, never. I was reading about the floods a year ago in Alberta, and I thought, well, as bad as it gets in Alberta, we can have confidence that it's not going to cover the whole earth like it did in Genesis. And the promise that God made 
is shown to us via the rainbow, right? So whenever we see a rainbow, we should remember God's promise to us, whether it's in the sky or on a flag, that's God's sign to us that he will never again cause a flood to cover the entire earth. His promise to us, absolutely guaranteed. The Lord said in John 14, 6, the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. No one comes to the Father but through me. No other God, no other person, no other system, no other way. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's a promise. It's a guarantee. I am the way, he said. I am the truth. I am the life. It's a guarantee. You don't have to worry about that. That's always true. Acts 1, 11. This Jesus, the angel said to the apostles, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He's not returning by bus or any other mode of transportation. Jesus is coming back through the sky. That's a promise. It's guaranteed. There's no doubt that that's going to happen. Acts 1, 11 promises us that. That's absolutely guaranteed in the Lord's economy. So there's a difference between the principles we see in Proverbs and the promises we see throughout the rest of Scripture, okay? Well, let's have a little quick o quiz If you buy lottery tickets, you're not going to make money. You're going to lose money. Is that a principle or promise? Principle or promise? What do you think? If you buy lottery tickets, you're, go you're not going to make money. You're going to lose money. Uh, let's see. I think that's a principle. Because we know some people play the lottery and they win lots of money. Not many people, but some people do. So it's not a promise, it's a principle of life. Most people lose money by playing the lottery. How about this one? You can't win if you don't play. There is no way you can win the lottery if you don't play the lottery. Principle or promise? That's obviously a promise. You absolutely cannot win if you don't play. Somebody's got to win. But if somebody's got to win, is it a principle or a promise that says you won't win if you do play? You won't win if you do play. Principle or promise? Principle. Some people win. A very, very tiny minority of people win the lottery when they play. A large majority don't win. The principle is you're probably going to lose and you're not going to win if you do play. That's a principle. So we've got principles and promises. Proverbs is filled with principles. Wise advice one. This is the first wise advice from the book of Proverbs. Don't link yourself with a foolish person. That doesn't mean don't rub shoulders with them. It's okay to rub shoulders with them and try to witness to them and help them see the ways of the Lord. But don't link yourself with them. Uh, don't link arms in business. Don't get married to a fool. Don't link with a person in a way that's going to end up hurting you. You don't link with a foolish person, also known as a faithless person, a person who ignores the Lord or despises his ways. I know lots of good people, actually, who ignore the Lord. They're not overtly antagonistic toward Jesus or his ways. But the Bible would say that person is foolish. That person is foolish. The faithless person is a person who ignores the Lord or despises his ways. That's wisdom promise number one from, well, wisdom principle number one from the book of Proverbs. How about the personal characteristics of a fool? I've written down a few of these. There's a, few, a lot more than I've written down here, but we have a short window of time to go through this. But the first one, for example, the personal character of a fool, like vinegar to the teeth, and smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to those who send him. Proverbs 10, 26. He's lazy, so he's unreliable. It's like smoke to the eyes. Have you ever had smoke in your eyes? It's not a comfortable feeling. Now, I had never had vinegar in my mouth, but I tested this principle, and I thought, well, we'll see if the Lord's correct in the principle of life. So I, I took some vinegar out of our cabinet in our kitchen at home, and I poured some in a glass, and I I took a, a large swig, I switched it around in there, and I thought, wow, this is really bad. Uh, this hurts, like vinegar, the, the teeth really do hurt, and the gums hurt, and you know, you could go on and on and say, this was a bad idea. That's what it's like when you link with a fool. So I took that vinegar, I spit it back in the bottle for later use. And, <laughs> no, no, I'm not quite that cheap, I didn't do that. I got rid of it, my wife is happy to know. Um, that person is lazy. It's like vinegar on the teeth. It's like smoke in the eyes. That person is like a sluggard to you. That, it's, it's like sending someone who won't do the job. He's lazy, and the result is going to be bad. He's unreliable. How about the personal character of a fool, another one? He's out of control, so he's dangerous. 
Proverbs 17, 12, like a man, or I'm sorry, let a man meet a she-bear robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. The writer says, I'd rather meet a bear, a mama bear, who's been separated from her baby cubs than a fool in his folly. Now, if you know anything about bears, you know that is really bad. I used to take my sons up to Minnesota to the Boundary Waters. We used to stay there for a week or so where there was nothing but canoes and water, and you carried your food on your back, and you carried your tent, and you had no facilities. It was a very, a very um, uh, building up experience for my young sons. But we were warned in the early days of our, of our visiting that wilderness that if you see a bear, especially if you see baby cub bears, that's very dangerous. <clears throat> You mean no harm. Baby cub bears are not to be played with. They're not to be toyed with, primarily because of the mama bear. A mama bear sees a person who's near her cubs, and she gets very angry. She's very dangerous, and she gets violent because she's concerned about her baby cubs. You mothers will understand this. I don't know where the father bear is, but the mother bear is mentioned in Proverbs. (laughs) He's out of control. This person who's like this, you meet a she-bear. Let's see, should I meet a she-bear robbed of her cubs, or should I meet a fool in his folly. I wonder which I should do. I think I'll choose the bear. What? Really? Yes, the proverb says you choose the bear. That's how bad it is to deal with a fool. He's out of control. He's dangerous. Don't link with a fool. Here's one. The personal character of a fool. Trusting in a treacherous man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth or a foot that slips. Another translation, this is from the English Standard Version. Another translation says it's like a foot out of joint. Trusting in a treacherous man, a person who is not worthy of your trust. Trusting in that person when you're in trouble, and trouble will come. When you have trouble and you trust in a in a treacherous person, it's like you have a bad tooth or a foot that slips. You ever try to walk on a bad foot? Or if you've ever had a bad tooth, there's hardly anything else that you can think about except that bad tooth, right? That's what it's like to trust in a treacherous person. The Lord gives us these great illustrations to give us a sense of the truth and how it bears out in life. He's deceptive, so he cannot be trusted. Don't link with him. Don't trust that person. He's deceptive. He can't be trusted. A wisdom principle from Proverbs 25, 19. How about this one? He's a coward. Fools are cowardly. He's always in danger. The fear of man lays a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is safe, Proverbs 29, 25. I know that, gee, I'm afraid of this person at work. He could hurt me or she could hurt me or that situation with my neighbor or this situation in my family, that that person could hurt me pretty badly. But you know what? The Lord has the situation in hand. He knows what's going on. We trust in the Lord. We do what's right in God's eyes. We have skill for living. We trust in the Lord. Therefore, we have courage. The person who's a fool is afraid of people all the time. He's afraid of his situation. He has no confidence in God at all. He doesn't believe in God. He scoffs at God. So he's a coward. He's always in danger. Proverbs 29, 25. Don't link yourself with that kind of a person. How about the relationships of a fool? What's it look like in their relationships? Well, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. But the companion of fools will suffer loss. Proverbs 13, 20. He hangs around other fools. Fools hang around fools. So he's a loser. And I say loser because the scripture says lose. I'm not being unkind. He says, uh, the scripture says, a companion of fools will suffer loss. He's going to lose stuff. He's going to lose something because of his companions. You want to be a wise person, whether you're young here or old here, it doesn't matter. Whoever walks with wise people will become wise. They'll influence you. That's the kind of relationship you want. But foolish people hang around other fools and they lose. Ultimately, they lose. He is relationally stupid. Foolish people are relationally stupid. Proverbs 26, 17 teaches us the principle that whoever meddles in a quarrel that is not his own is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. Here's a dog. The picture is so wonderful. Here's a dog minding his own business, passing by, and I think I'll just grab that dog by the ears. Is that a good idea? What's worse? Grabbing a she-bear lost of her cubs by the ears or grabbing a dog by the ears? I mean, they're both bad. You grab a dog by the ears, what's going to happen? Even the most amiable dog, like the Bartlett's dogs, for example, will get angry. They'll get angry. So you've got a dog by the ears. He's just been minding his own business. You've got him by the ears. Well, now what do you do? What do you do with a dog by the ears? You have to 
Let them go. You let go of one ear, you're going to get bitten. You let go of both ears, you're going to get really bitten badly. That's called foolishness. You shouldn't have been grabbing that dog by the ears. Mind your own business is what the proverb would teach us. Whoever meddles in a quarrel that's not his own, it's not your business. Stay out of it. Is one who takes a passing dog by the ears, Proverbs 26, 17. Be relationally intelligent. A fool is relationally stupid. Here's a good one. He lacks self-awareness. A fool just is, has no clue about how he's affecting people. A fool gives full vent to his spirit. Whatever comes into his little mind, he spits out of his mouth. If he gives full vent to everything, there's no, no reticence to open his mind widely in front of everybody to hear, no matter how ungodly or foolish his thoughts. He gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. He knows when to release. He knows when to speak. He knows when to remain quiet. He knows when to release everything. He knows the situation. He's got skill for living. A foolish person lacks self-awareness. He doesn't really know how he appears and comes off to other people. Be careful of those people. They're foolish. More relationships of a fool. He doesn't listen. Fools don't listen. They're violent. Now, they may be physically violent or they may be emotionally violent. Uh, The words of a Unwise person are like the thrusts of a sword, another proverb tells us. They, they're hurtful. Whoever corrects a scoffer, another word for a foolish person or a person who scoffs at God's wisdom, whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. And he reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Sometimes it's better not even to talk to a fool. If a fool's going to scoff at your wisdom, you're like throwing pearls after swine. That's not a great choice. A fool doesn't listen, he's violent. Reproving him will get yourself abuse and incur yourself injury. So, wise advice too from Proverbs. Be wise, be skilled in life, love the Lord's ways, know the Lord's ways, and pursue the Lord's ways. So, remember we talked about the earlier proverb that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the foundation point of wisdom, of skill for living, is the fear of the God who made this world. He made you personally. He knows you. He knows me. He knows exactly how he put us together. So listen to what he says about us. You have an owner's manual for a car. You know how it works. You're supposed to read the manual and figure it out. That's the maker of the car knows it, so he gives you a manual. That's just like the Lord gives us the book of Proverbs and the rest of scriptures. So love the Lord's ways Know the Lord's ways by reading his word, understanding it, and helping and getting help from wise people who love the Lord and can give you wisdom, and then pursue the Lord's ways. That's wise advice number two. In this culture, in Canada, or in the U.S. where I'm from, this is not the wisdom of the world. The world scoffs at this. Like wisdom is calling out at the gates, as we saw earlier, as a woman screaming at the gates to listen, and they scoff. But we don't want to be like that. And we have a resource in the scriptures to teach us how to live rightly. Here's a personal characteristic of the wise. This is much more encouraging. The wise person wants the way of the Lord. In contrast to a a fool. Doing wrong is like a joke to a fool. But wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. I really enjoy doing things that are wise, a wise person says. I enjoy the skill I have for living based upon my knowledge of God's word. Not because I'm so smart, but because God wants me to work and live in this life in a way that will not hurt myself. That is a wise person. He wants the ways of a Lord, unlike the fool who simply does wrong things like a joke. He laughs at his own foolishness. It's ridiculous. It's very painful. It's very hurtful. A wise person wants the ways of the Lord. The wise person is a thoughtful person. The simple believe everything. But the prudent gives thought to his steps, Proverbs 14, 15. Now, I have two daughters and two sons. One of them is married. I have, I'm mostly concerned about my daughters. I don't know why. But, by, uh, but when they hear from a guy and this guy has, is saying all kinds of things, I'm saying now in my heart, I have to be careful how I say it to them personally. But I, I, I think to myself, boy, I hope, Lord, that the, she's not believing everything, everything she's hearing. Same thing for my son. Don't believe everything you hear Give thought to your steps. Give thought to what you hear and then act accordingly. The wise person is a thoughtful person. That's one of the characteristics of a wise person. How about this one? If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Proverbs 24.10. He is strong in difficulty because of his wisdom. And remember, we get wisdom by loving the ways of the Lord, 
learning the ways of the Lord and acting upon them. As you study his word, as you meditate on it, as you contemplate who he is and his goodness and his awesomeness, and as you consult with friends who also love the Lord and can help you impart wisdom, you'll be strong in difficulty. And difficulty will come. Maybe not today. Maybe next week. It will come. But you'll be strong in difficulty because of your wisdom. How about another one? In the relationships of a wise person. A wise person is, is empathetic. And he does not rejoice in the pain of others. Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. He who is glad in calamity will not go unpunished. Have you known anybody that mocks poor people, whether they're economically poor or down and out or discouraged or just poor in various ways that you can be poor in this life? Uh, some people mock them and make fun of them. I, I don't know. Maybe it makes them feel stronger or better about their own miserable existence without the Lord. But whoever does that insults the Lord himself. Also, he who is glad in calamity will not go unpunished. I used to work with a person who was glad whenever she heard about someone else who had trouble. Trouble at work, a, a project didn't go right, and this person just was, oh, it's so, I don't understand that. This person was delighted when someone else had trouble. Again, maybe to make herself feel better or stronger. Uh, but a wise person is empathetic. He feels the pain of others. He laughs with those who laughs, and he weeps with those who weep. He also does not rejoice in the pain of others. That's a wise person. How about one who is careful in speech? As opposed to the one foolish person who releases his entire spirit without thought at all about what he's saying. A wise person, it says in Proverbs 20, 17, 27, and 28. Proverbs 17, 27, 28 says, Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and the one who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Well, that's easy, isn't it? People can think you're intelligent if you just don't say anything. Now, that's a great encouragement to me personally. Restraining your words is a sign of knowledge of yourself and of God's ways. Um, if you have a cool spirit, if you're not easily flustered, your boat doesn't overturn every time a high wave comes, you're a man of understanding or a woman of understanding. It doesn't matter. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. Closing your lips oftentimes leads people to think you're intelligent. You've you got to be careful in your speech if you're going to be a wise person. Just be careful what you say. You have to be bold oftentimes, but be careful. Discerning. A wise person is a sweet friend. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, Proverbs 27, 9 says. Oil and perfume make the heart glad. And the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. His earnest counsel. He's, he cares about you. He loves you. He wants what's best for you. He wants God's blessing in your life. And he's earnestly counseling you to follow the ways of the Lord. Based upon his scriptural knowledge and his love for God and the love of the Lord's ways. That is a sweet friend. You hold on to those people in your life. Those people are not common. You hold those people dearly. He's a sweet friend. That's what you're looking for. All right. So you can enjoy the fruit of wise living. Proverbs gives us another few comments about this. You'll be spiritually strong, strong as you enjoy wise living. There's fruit that comes from the planting of this seed. You'll be spiritually strong. A wise man is full of strength. In other words, a man or woman who has skill for living is full of strength. A man of knowledge enhances his might, Proverbs 24, 5. The strong person gets stronger as a person embraces God's ways, loves the Lord's ways, seeks the counsel of godly, godly friends, gets into the word, he gets strong, stronger, strongest. You'll be spiritually strong to endure whatever happens in this life. No matter what life throws at you, no matter what happens, you will be spiritually strong as a wise person, getting wiser all the time. Enjoy the fruit of good living, of wise living rather. You'll be confident. The wicked flees when no one pursues. But the righteous person, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. As bold as a lion. A righteous person is as bold as a lion. What is a lion afraid of? What is a lion afraid of? Nothing. Nothing. A lion's afraid of nothing. The Lord Jesus Christ is known as the Lion of Judah. Who is Jesus afraid of? Nothing. That's why the picture is the lion. Lions fear nothing in the kingdom. They're the strongest. They have confidence. You, as a wise person... Again, wisdom is skill for living. doesn't matter how 
smart you are. It just matters how much you embrace God's ways and learn them and act upon them. The wicked flees when no one pursues because he's afraid. He's a coward. He's worried about everything that comes his way. He flees when no one is pursuing him. The righteous person is as bold as a lion. What a great thing. You'll have confidence in this life. You'll have hope for the future. I was so blessed by the worship this morning, as, as Derek has already pointed out. What, what great songs. I, I was thinking how perfect the selection of the worship songs today in conjunction with the, uh, a sermon on the book of Proverbs. They were just so perfectly selected. You'll have hope for the future. Proverbs 24, 13, and 14. My son, again, this is wisdom talking. My son, eat honey, for it is good. It's the picture of wisdom. Eat honey, for it is good, and the drippings of the honeycomb are sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is such to your soul. If you find it, there will be a future, and your hope will not be cut off. You'll have hope for the future, not despair. You'll have hope for good things, for a good life, for a life that is pleasing to the Lord and is sweet to you, no matter what happens. You have a hope for the future. That's another fruit of wise living. I don't know who, who doesn't want that, right? So you'll be spiritually strong. You'll be confident. You'll have hope for the future, the fruit of wise living. Well, do you remember who wrote most of the book of Proverbs, most of the Proverbs? It was Solomon. King Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs. He was the son of David, the king of Israel. He was the wisest man on the face of the earth. In fact, if we look at 1 Kings chapter 10, the queen of Sheba wanted to visit with Solomon because she had heard of his great wisdom. In 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 3, it says that Solomon answered all of her questions, all of the queen of Sheba's questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. He had skill for living. He wrote the book of Proverbs, most of them. The queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, all the things that he had done, everything he knew about the Lord and how to do things. And she said to the king in verse 6, The report was true that I heard in my own land about your words and of your wisdom. I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. She made a trip to go visit Solomon because she heard how great he was, how wise he was. And as great as she heard, she says, you're twice as good as I thought you were. You're amazing. However, Solomon ran into trouble. And this is an important point. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, if you look at the course of his life, Solomon had many, many, many wives and concubines. He had a problem with some of his self-control. He had many wives and concubines. He laid burdensome taxes on the people. Horribly taxed the people were leading to misery. He used forced labor to build God's temple, to build a house for himself, and to build other edifices, other buildings in the kingdom. He used forced labor. He worshipped idols. He worshipped and sacrificed to idols. Can you believe that? The wisest man in the world worshipped idols. Now, how did he end up worshipping idols? If we look at 1 Kings chapter 11, we see that King Solomon loved many foreign women. King Solomon loved many foreign women, and he violated uh, the Lord's command that said, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their own gods. Small g, idols, gods. They'll turn your heart away from them. But he clung, Solomon clung to these women in love, and they turned his heart away from the Lord. How could a wise man do that? First Kings 11, verse 6 says, Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord. He did not wholly follow the Lord. He turned, and he did what was evil, offering sacrifices and worshiping idols. Can you believe it? And guess what? There's fruit to this. There's fruit of foolishness. The fruit is the Lord was angry with Solomon. Why? In verse 9, the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing. Imagine the privilege Solomon had. God personally appeared to him twice so that he could know who this God is. Therefore, verse 11, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant. Now you notice he didn't say, Solomon, since you stumbled once and did this thing, since you stumbled once 
in any of the areas we just discussed about women, about taxes, about forced labor, about idolatry, about your astounding wealth, which, by the way, violated Deuteronomy 17.17, 17, where the Lord warns that rulers should not have immense wealth. Solomon's wealth was so immense, it was almost immeasurable. It was beyond our ability to comprehend. He violated all of it. But God said, this has been your practice, Solomon. You have not kept my covenant and the statutes I have commanded you. Here's what I'm going to do, he says. I'll tear the kingdom from, your, from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear, it away, tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son. One tribe, Solomon. This is the fruit of your foolishness. So the wisest man in all the world, Queen of Sheba, was so impressed with him. He's twice as bright in God's ways than anybody else, or than she thought she, uh, he was. He was amazing. How is it that a man so wise could be so, so foolish? Well, let's make sure we understand. Wisdom, skill for living, is not godliness. Wisdom is not the same as godliness. You can be a wise person and make some very, very, very bad choices, as Solomon did. It's, it goes like this. Uh, pre- let's imagine that Solomon is a, is a carpenter, a master carpenter. He's got all the tools to build houses really well. He's got years of experience in house building. He builds amazing, amazing houses and other buildings. It's just amazing. But he decides, you know, I, I know I've got skill for living. I, I know how to use these tools. I don't, but I'm going to build my house on sand today. I'm going to build a bunch of houses on sand. Forget about the rock that the Lord wants. Forget about that. I think I'm going to build on sand just because I feel like it, because I want to. And I'm not going to use a plumb line. I'm going to, I'm going to lay the brick on this sandy house, on the sandy foundation for this house. I'm just going to lay it. I'm going to eyeball it. I'm not going to use a plumb line. I'm not going to make sure the walls are straight or the bricks are straight. I'm just going to eyeball it and, and do it that way. I think I'm pretty good. You see, he abandoned what he knew of God. He abandoned the Lord's ways. He knew how to build a house. He had skill for living, but he wasn't godly. This large season of his life, he was not a godly man. So as we think about how to be skillful in living, we need to remember that we need to root ourselves in the Lord. Love the Lord's ways. Learn the Lord's ways. Pursue the Lord's ways. Pursue relationships with people who love the Lord. Keep away from fools. Don't link with them. Keep away in the sense that you don't link with them. Don't marry them. Don't go into business with them. Don't rely upon them for counsel. Witness to them, try to convert them uh, through the Lord to to receive Christ as Savior, but don't link yourselves because you'll hurt yourself. Jesus wants us to live a good life where we don't fall into the holes of foolishness. He loves us. He wants us to live a life that's skillful and godly as we love the Lord, as we consider his awesomeness. Revelation 1 talks about God's awesomeness, the risen Savior, the logos of the Trinity, and sometimes, you know what, we need a fresh picture of the awesomeness of our God to really inspire us to say, this God is the one who loves me. This is the God who, who knows how I ought to live, and I'm going to do it. Based upon my strength of my relationship with Christ, my knowledge of his word, and others who can hold me accountable and support me in this work. And as I pray, it's going to happen. You'll have confidence in the future, and you'll have a hope. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for your faithfulness, your mercy, and your grace to us. You are awesome. You are the only one who's awesome. And Lord, um, as awesome as you are, you choose to work with small people like everyone here. I speak of everyone here, myself and everyone here. Lord, we are totally lost without you, and we thank you for your graciousness to us. And Lord, I pray that as we think about Proverbs, as we think about what it means to be skillful in living, And as we seek to carry out your word, I pray we'd do the wise thing, continue feeding on your word, continue meditating on who you are and how awesome you are and how smart you are, how wise you are about your creation. And we feed into the relationships with other wise people who love you, Lord. And that way we have a hope and a future and can live a life filled with skill. Help us to be godly, not just smart about living, but godly and apply the word to our lives. Thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness faithfulness to us, Lord. We ask this and proclaim this in the name of our great Savior, Jesus. Amen.